It's Rob Berger. I uh, hope you're having a good evening. As always, give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can hear me and see me. I got a kick out of uh, D.B. Douglas right when it hit seven. All rise. I like it. Yep. Just waiting for the thumbs up. I'm going to actually, I've got a question. We're going to start off with a question that I want to ask you guys. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Steve, for the thumbs up and everyone else. Um, so I just have a question, and it's a simple one. It's, do you own a business? And keep in mind that a lot of people own a business and they don't even realize it, right? So if you like drive for Uber and you get a 1099, you're a business owner. It's a sole proprietorship unless you've set it up as an LLC or an S Corp. Of course, you could own a partnership. You could write for people on the side or do some sort of consulting and do it as an co independent contractor. You're a business owner. So I'm just curious, how many we got viewing right at this moment? Just 200. That's pretty good. It'll get up to probably five or 600. Maybe I should wait. Uh, I'm going to ask it now. Um, and then we'll just let that go. I'm just it's curious. I'll tell you why I'm asking that in a minute. So the, the topic I want to cover just to begin with, and I'll get to your questions. I got a few other things to show you. It's been busy. Um, by the way, I learned something over the last two weeks. I, I just found it shocking. Did you know that Lululemon sells men's clothing? I didn't know. In fact, look, let me see. Look at this. These are, these are Lululemon pants and they're soft. I like them. Very nice. I don't know. I think Untuck It might be out, although this is an Untuck It shirt. I've still not heard from them about a, a, a you know, sponsorship. Of course, I've not reached out to them. All right. Uh, let's stay focused, Rob. So we're going to take a quick look. This is the fancy Berkshire Hathaway website. You can see Warren Buffett puts a lot of money. I like how he even does advertising. He's got a Geico link here. Anyway, we can go here. Uh, here are his letters right here to uh, Berkshire shareholders. I've been a shareholder since, uh, I want to say 2013, maybe. Anyway, uh, here's the letter that he wrote. Uh, it's, it's, for, it's, the, it's for the year into 2023, but it just came out this past Saturday. I highly recommend that you read it. Uh, you know, if I could only read one thing in terms of trying to become a better in investor, this, th these letters would be uh, probably the thing that I would read, at least for general understanding of uh, how investing works and how, how businesses work. He has here uh, a special note, of course, Charlie Munger passed away uh, at the end of last year. The interesting thing about the note here, and you'll read it, but I'll just point one thing out, is that and, and and Buffett has has alluded to this in the past, but he, he gives he gives Charlie Munger credit for the structure of Berkshire. You know the company. You know he bought it. It was a textile company. It was basically, you know, kind of went downhill uh, as textiles generally did in the United States. Textile companies, uh, but he used it basically as I guess a holding company. I don't know if that's quite the right term, but you know it owns other businesses, right? But the, the 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 contribution that Warren Buffett has always credited Charlie Munger for is that before you know they got together and and you know in, in the early days, Warren Buffett was very much in trying to find cheap companies, very very inexpensive relative to their earnings, and he you know the way he puts it now is that Charlie Munger made him see the light that he should try to he should try to buy fabulous companies at fair prices rather than fair companies at fabulous prices. And that was sort of a big aha moment for uh, Warren Buffett and, and, and Charlie Munger helped him see that. And he talks about it in that letter. That's the first, you know, I mentioned, I'm going to, to share my thoughts on this letter. That was one of them. And, and so that was sort of, uh, that was just a, the sort of the beginning part. The letter actually starts here. And um, I'm not going to, don't, I don't need to show it to you online. I'll, I'll just go back, you know, to you looking at me. Uh, uh, but um, I, I, I do recommend that you read the letter, particularly the first few pages before he gets into maybe more detail about some of the businesses that Berkshire owns that maybe you're not interested in. A couple of things stand out uh, to me. Um, and, and the first, uh, there, there's a couple. The first is he talks about businesses that Berkshire will own forever. And he mentions Coca-Cola and American Express, maybe the railroad. He talks in detail about the railroad that Berkshire owns. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. 
it's interesting to me. I don't think, unless I missed it, which yeah, I might have missed it. But I don't think he mentions Apple as uh, a company that they might own forever. Uh, no, I don't think so. And that makes sense to me because, you know, when you think about a company, you think, well, how could Coca-Cola, you know, it's going to have its ups and downs and all that, but how is it going to go away? How, how is it going to be become irrelevant? Uh, and it's kind of hard to answer that question. I mean, I guess we could try to think of some kind of series of events that would, would cause that to happen, but pretty hard. You know, it's not like technology is going to do it in. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, it, you know, people have enjoyed soft drinks, you know, for better or worse. I don't generally drink them, but, <laughs> uh, a lot of people do. And I did in the past, uh, you know, for whatever, I mean, Coca-Cola has been in business a very long time and he's just the kind of business he feels comfortable owning. Apple, as big as it is, obviously the largest company right now uh, by market cap, I think it's still the largest. I know Microsoft, uh, was competing for that for a bit. But you, you could imagine, you know, new technologies, if it doesn't keep up with what consumers want, you know, it could, it could, I don't think it's going to go away tomorrow, of course, but it, it could certainly lose its position. And, you know, uh, I don't know how, of course, Warren Buffett thinks about it, but I found it interesting that he thinks, how he thinks about these companies in terms of some that he would be comfortable owning forever. On the railroad front, he, he made the point that, look, railroads are critical to, our country and transportation of goods over long distances, and particularly uh, goods that are are quite large and heavy stuff, right? Um, and that'll be the case 100 years from now. And that seems probably, that seems accurate to me. I mean, I guess anything's possible, but uh, that seems right to me. Will Apple be around 100 years from now? Mm, I don't know. Uh, so I just found that interesting in terms of how he thinks about it. Uh, in terms of the railroad, I really encourage you to read it if you want to understand that not all companies are created equal in, in terms of the capital that they require. Uh, and railroads, I think the way he put it was they eat capital. You know, you think about a railroad, it's got the tracks, it's got tunnels, it's got bridges. It's, of course, it's got locomotives and cars and all of these things wear out and have to get replaced. And it's very, very expensive. And one of the things he compares... I know we're kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, so just bear with me for a couple of minutes, and I promise I'll turn to your questions. He says, look, here's how much it's, it's, it's depreciation expense is. So if you think about, let's just do accounting 101. Uh, if a railroad buys a locomotive, a big engine, I don't know what locomotives cost. Let's say it's $25 million. What do I know? Uh, that doesn't affect its income statement right away, right? There's no expense associated with that. They're buying an asset that's going to last for longer than a year. So if they pay cash, you know, you credit the cash account, which reduces it by $25 million, and you debit the locomotive account. They're just trading one asset type for another. Uh, but then what happens is they have to depreciate that asset over, I don't know how, how many years you depreciate a locomotive. Let's just say it's 30 years. And so every year they've got to take one thirtieth of the price and depreciate it. So what's that look like? Well, they're gonna they're gonna credit the locomotive asset on their balance sheet to reduce it by a million bucks or whatever the depreciation expense is, and they're gonna debit an expense item on their income statement called depreciation. And so when you add up all of those depreciation expenses, I think he said it was ninety billion. Let me see if I can find that number. I could be wrong. Yeah, ninety billion. Uh, is that right? I think that's right. It was a big number. And, um, but the point he made was what you want to do is compare that to how much additional money we're spending every year on new capital of improvement, the capital improvements that will have to be depreciated later. And that number, again, I'm going to search for it. I'm pretty sure it was 500 billion. It was a big number, something like, yeah, 500 billion, um, uh, to replace, the whole railroad, uh, they're not spending 500 billion a year. But the point is new capital uh, expenses, no, not expenses, uh, outlays are much, much higher than the annual depreciation. And as an investor, that matters because um, when you see their, their profit for the year, that's not gonna include a, a, a reduction for that $25 million locomotive that they bought. 
it's only going to show the the part of that big purchase that they depreciated that year. So in a, in a way, it almost seems like they're inflating their 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 net income, their profit. Uh, uh, I mean, they're not. That's you know that's how gap accounting works. Uh, you you want to sort of expense it in the period in which it's used, and a locomotive is used over a, a number of years, right? That's sort of the idea behind it. But as an investor, we need to be aware of that because you might see them for every dollar in profit they make, they got to hold a lot of that back to reinvest back into the business, not to grow it, just to maintain it. Does that make sense? And, and he points out that's one of the reasons that while that railroad pays Berkshire a dividend, it flows up to the to, 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 to Omaha uh, and, and Buffett decides what to do with that capital, it's not anywhere near their actual profits, much, much lower because they have to hold back retained earnings what they call it, a lot of money so they can build new bridges or replace bridges and tunnels and all this sort of thing. And um, he does a good job, much better than I am right now, explaining all of this. And I think it's, it's, it's a, particularly if you invest in individual stocks, it's a really important concept to understand. And it relates to something that Buffett in the past, I don't know if he mentioned it here, calls owner's earnings. You can Google that. Uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. The last thing I'll mention, and then I'm prom I promise I'm done, uh, I see Paul says railroads could lease their trains. Yeah, it's just financing, right? Uh, it, it gets account. Well, it, it may or may not get accounted for differently. Actually, how you account for a lease can, gets complicated. It depends on uh, how, how long you lease it. It's used for life. And I'm not a, a CPA. I just know that from my work at the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. In any event, see, I've lost my train of thought. Um, one thing that I found fascinating, so they have invested in five uh, Japanese companies. That's sort of been big news. He talks about it. They've done very well since they started buying these companies in 2019. I think they disclosed their purchase in 2020. And uh, a couple of things about that. One, I, I wish, uh, and I don't I haven't seen this. Maybe he's, he's disclosed this somewhere else. I'd like to know exactly what he noticed in 2019 that made him believe that one, Japan was a good investment because it's been stagnant for 30 years uh, and that these particular companies were good investments. He seemed to, to, to get the timing right just perfect. And I, what, you know, what did he notice? But he also mentioned that uh, Abel, who is going to take over for him someday, um, Greg Abel, uh, went with them over there to, to meet the management of these companies, which I think is a good thing. But here's the thing that I found interesting, because I get this question a lot. What will Berkshire be like when Warren Buffett's gone? And um, he made the comment that uh, in a, one of the advantages of these investments is not just as an investment, hopefully it does well over time, but that par partnering with these companies might give them additional investment opportunities with other in other entities or other situations uh, uh, perhaps I don't, he didn't get specifics, but perhaps in conjunction with these companies. And I found that interesting. And it made me, it, it made me wonder if part of his thinking is, uh, he's trying to put Greg Abel in, in the best position to get these sort of great deals when he's gone right now, Berkshire can get deals because he's Warren Buffett and, uh, but he's not always going to be there. And, I, you know, for me, we own Berkshire Hathaway stock, B shares. I don't plan to sell it now or I have no plans to sell it, whether Warren Buffett stays for a year or however long he's still there. Uh, but I found maybe I'm reading more into that, but I kind of got a sense that he's definitely looking long, long term there um, and that he sees those investments as a lot more than just those investments, which I found interesting. Anyway, all right, I'm done. I'll stop talking. Well, at least about that. I guess I have to try to answer some of your questions. By the way, let's see how many of you own. So 20% own businesses. Okay. The reason I, I'll tell you why I asked that. Um, then I'm going to show you one thing on, on the website and then, then we're off to your questions. Uh, I own uh, Dole Roller and it has a YouTube channel. And I've not done much with that YouTube channel, I, in part because I can't quite figure out what I want to do with it. This channel is investing in retirement. That's not going to change, you know, I don't want a whole lot of overlap with Rob Berger dot or with the, the Doe Roller uh, YouTube channel. So my thought was, I, one thought I had was to make it um, small business. You know, I really enjoy, I, you know, when, whenever I'm with someone and they own a business and we're talking about small business and how to run it and how to work with contractors or employees and financing and 
uh, business and cash flow. I just love that stuff. And so I thought maybe I might turn the, the dough roller YouTube channel into covering small business. I don't know. If you care about it, you can always shoot me an email, tell me what you think. Uh, the last thing before we get to your questions, I want to show you. So I think last week I showed you the tools directory, not last week, two weeks ago, the tools directory, right? This right here. So if I can make it a little bigger, I've added, let's see, we've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 27. I've got another 10 that just need to be published. Um, so I'm adding more to that. I added this research tab here and, um, I don't know how many I've got in there, maybe a half, a, a dozen or so. And, um, so I've got hundreds of papers and it could be blog articles, whatever that I've, I've read or, or academic papers, white papers. Um, and, uh, and so I've started to put together all of these so you'll have access to them. And then, you know, I've got the, you can go to the source. In this case, this happens to be a Schwab paper. I give you my rating, uh, which I'll talk more about that, uh, and, and, and whatnot, but, um, you can look at, some, if there's charts, of course, you, like I said, you can go to the source. The other thing I'm working on, so tools and research, I'm going to have withdrawal strategies. I'm going to show you one in a second. That's going to be another tab. So, you know, 4% rule, all the different withdrawal strategies, Guyton Klinger, all the ratcheting rule. Um, uh, I'm going to have one for, for model portfolios, three fund, you know, all of Paul Merriman's portfolios, uh, Rick Ferry, Core 4, all of that stuff. Um, I'm going to have a books uh, section um, and maybe one or two others. But what's, you know, wh what I think is going to make this valuable, and, and basically I'm trying to design this so it's valuable to me in the hopes that, that it's also valuable to you, but it's how I, I link all of this stuff together. These are not going to just be standalone items. And let me show you what I mean. So this is a, a withdrawal strategy. It's actually the only one I have published. Uh, I'll have a bunch more and then uh, a link up at the top two weeks from now. This is the plan. This one happens to be one I just learned about. I never heard of it before. And the basic idea behind this one is uh, to reduce your spending each year in retirement on the theory that that's how most retirees live anyway. And um, But the thing is, what I thought, so what would be cool is I thought, well, are there any of the, you know, if we go back to tools, right, all our tools here. Are there any tools that allow us to model any withdrawal strategy? In this case, we're looking at this one. Well, sure enough, turns out there is. It's FireCalc. In fact, it's FireCalc that how I found out about this tool or about this withdrawal strategy. So I have this section on related tools. If you click it, you go to FireCalc. This is the tool on my website. You can go to FireCalc here. Um, and then I have related withdrawal strategy. We go right back to that, Bern, I guess, Bernicke, retirement, uh, reality retirement plan. Uh, I have more to add because like fire calc can do more than just that. If you do a, you know, uh, um, FI calc can do several, um, projection lab can do several. So for, depending on the tool, you know, you might see a half a dozen withdrawal strategies. If they can model, if they have, you know, functionality that allows you to model all of those, you'll have them all right here. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'll link research papers. So if you could see a withdrawal strategy, uh, here are the two or 10 or 20 research papers, blog posts, whatever that, that analyze that withdrawal strategy that you can check out. I'll have another section for articles that I've written on robberger.com. So if I write an article about this Bernicke, I don't plan to, <laughs> but Bernicke uh, withdrawal strategy, um, you'd see that on the withdrawal strategy too. Hey, here's my article on it or whatever. So that's the idea. Yeah, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, everything I do is a marathon. Okay. All right, enough chit-chat. Enough of that stuff. By the way, Noreen, thank you. I see you're in the house. Matt might be here too. So Noreen and Matt help me. So um, you might see them pop up from time to time. If you want to ask a question, put at Rob Berger because I see it better. Um, but let's just dive right in. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I talked about the Lululemon pants. That was really important. They're so comfortable. My back's been bothering me. Yeah, so I might have to stand up more for during this.
period. I don't, you know, I, I tweaked my knee. I have a torn meniscus from a year ago, but I tweaked it playing volleyball, which is how I heard it. Uh, volleyball's out. Um, and then that kind of threw my back out. So um, it's been rough. All right. PP, planning for eight years of work before retiring at 40. All right. Can save four grand a month. So what's that? We'll call it 50, 50 grand a year, more or less. And place only in a taxable account. How would you plan for retirement? Estimated 25,000 a year needed. Huh. Well, let's just quickly do the math. 50,000 a year for eight years is 400 grand. And you're going to need 25 grand. Do you have any other money or debt? Do you own any real estate? If that's all you have, you have 400 grand plus what it earns between now and then, or minus what it loses. 400 grand times uh, 4% ain't going to get the job done, I don't think. And, and you've got to also deal then with taxes. And if you were retiring at 40, if I were retiring at 40, I would not be using the 4% rule. I, I, the, the, the richest I would get would be 3%, and I'd probably be 2.5%. And that's assuming, you know, I'm taking, you know, what you said, you're really retired, you're done, you're hanging it up, you're turning in the playbook. There could be more to your story, right? But what I'm reading there, I think that's going to be... I'm not sure that's a hill I'd want to climb. By the way, I, I've been watching, is it Masters of, of the Air? Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's really good. From Apple TV. It's about World War II. Here it is. Really good. I only watched one episode. It's, you know, it's war. So, you know, there's parts of it that, you know, are tough to watch. Uh, although it's not, you know, not tough like Full Metal Jacket, if you, if you know what I'm saying. But, um I finished True Detective. I liked it. A little weird. I finished The Power Broker. Great book. Best bi biography I've ever read. I do wonder, I would have liked Caro to have told things also from Robert Caro, Caro, or from Robert Moses' perspective on some things. I don't I didn't always feel like I got the full story sometimes. All right. Anyway. Let's see here. I just lost a comment that I wanted to talk about. Where did it go? Well, I'll read it to you because I've got it over here. And and John, this is a, a viewer named Johnny email. He's from Ohio, so this is good people. What do you think about being uh, adjustable with stock allocation between, say, 50 and 75%, depending on signals that stocks are over or undervalued based on CAPE? Um, so the reason he picks 50 to 75% is that tends to be the sweet spot for like the 4% rule. Um, the problem with, I think with adjusting your stock allocation based on valuations, and I actually, I can, I can show you the problem from my perspective. Here we go. Here's the Cape. This is the Schiller PE. Cape is just cyclically adjusted PE. Um, what they, what Schiller does is um, I guess he still calculates this. I don't know. Maybe it's just done by computer. But he'll look at the last 10 years of earnings, adjust them for inflation, and, and calculate the PE on that basis. The theory being, you know, you get through a whole economic cycle. Um, I don't honestly feel all that strongly about it. Plus, I'm not sure it captures everything, like tax law changes. I'm not sure it fully cap ca captures that. But in any event, we can see here the mean is 17. See that down here? So let's see. The last time it was at 17 was, here we go, July, was it 18? Sometime between April and July of 2009. So it, it went above average. And so what do you do now? Do you cut back on your stocks and lose out on 15 years of incredible market returns? That's the problem I, I have with it. Just because, just because stocks are cheap, don't doesn't mean they're going to go up, and just because they're expensive doesn't mean they're going to go down. Now we can all sit back and say, "Well, reversion to the mean, sure." Uh, although the mean's changing all the time, but yeah, I, I, I don't expect stocks to go up forever, at least in the con what we're talking about. 
Um, so at some point they'll go down. At some point we'll have two or three or four bad years. Who knows? But I just don't know that I think I think it would be very, very difficult to sit on the sidelines um, for a very long time because stocks are, you know, X percent above their average and, and you're just watching them go up. For me, I, I mean, you know, maybe you can do it. Uh, I just I just don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. Okay. Oh, look at this. A chess question already from Keith. I was watching an old stream of yours. I saw at the end you did a random chess game and asked the audience for help. Sure, we can do one at the end. It was a chess problem. I have a love-hate relationship with chess. It's great when I'm winning. Anyway, okay. Michael wants my thoughts on this early retirement asset mix. Two years cash plus 40% VWELX. No idea what that is. Well, we'll look it up. 47.5% uh, total U.S. stock market, VTI. 12.5% total international, VXUS. VWELX, okay for covering bonds. Well, let's take a look-see. By the way, let me, let me, while I'm doing that, um, going to ask you another question. How do I want to word this? Um, will, I'll say, will my, I'll call them directories. That's the whole thing on my website, right? Um, the tools, the research, eventually the withdrawal rates. Will my directories, will the directories be useful to you? Yes or no? That'll help me. Of course, you can always email me more detailed thoughts. So, oh, VWELX. All right. Let's take a look here. Put this up on the screen so you can see I just searched the ticker up here for those that aren't as familiar with. Oh, Wellington. <laughs> I should know that. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I would not think of this as a bond alternative, and I'll show you why. So, uh, it's an actively uh, managed fund, but it's very inexpensive for an actively managed fund. Only one quarter of 1%. That's what that 0.250% means. If we go to the portfolio, though, it owns a lot of stock. 57%, 57.5% U.S., 7.5% international. It's only, we'll call it 34 35% fixed income. So... Uh, I wouldn't view this uh, as a bond alternative at all. Perfectly good fund for the right purposes. It's done extremely well. Um, I don't own it, but there's a lot of good funds I don't own. Um, so, but, but putting that issue aside, uh, so you've got 40% in that fund. So... You've only got about 12% in bonds, if my math, if my math chip is working correctly. 30% of 40%. I think that's right. Uh, so you know, I don't know how old you are. It says early retirement. I don't know if that's 40 or, or, or 50, 58. What is early retirement? Any anything before 60? I don't know. Uh, so I personally wouldn't use that fund as a bond alternative. What I would encourage you to do is get a tool. It could be Empower. You could do this in uh, Portfolio Visualizer. Uh, put all these in and look at the asset mix. It will tell you what it, what it is. But I think you're going to be roughly, you know, somewhere between 85 and 90% stocks. Um, I don't know how much of this you're spending each year. That would be relevant in, in analyzing it. I don't know if you have any debt, what your flexibility is. Um, in terms of the international exposure, I'm at 20-ish percent. I don't feel strongly that there's a right answer to that. Some some would say none, zero. I don't think 12.5% is unreasonable in my view. It's obviously lower than what I've chosen, but um, I, I do, as you know, I do think international exposure is important. Okay.
Uh, let me see here. I'm going to go back over here. I like to show you the questions on, on the screen, but okay. 90% says it's going to be helpful. Well, that's, that's good to know. I'll leave the poll running for a little bit and it's okay to say no. Uh, let's see. This is interesting from Woods Parker. Merrill Edge offered me a six month fee waiver to try their robo investment plan. I thought, why not give it a try with 2% of my portfolio? Rob, what are your thoughts on robo accounts? Well, my first question to you is, is it in a retirement account or a taxable account? If it's in a taxable account and you try it and you decide you don't like it and it's gone up and you pull the money out to put it back in wherever it, it came from, you may have to pay some taxes. Of course, if it's an IRA, then you don't have to worry about it. That's a point. Um, I, I like robo advisors. My favorite two are Wealthfront and Betterment. Um, but, but, you know, they do add some cost, of course, but I mean, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable for what services they provide. And a lot of folks just like hands off. And I've helped young people who, you know, I can always tell when I'm talking to someone, family member, a friend, and I, you know, and I, and I, and I say to them, I say, have you ever heard of an index fund? And they all always say no. And I explained to them the difference between an actively managed fund and an index fund. Within 30 seconds of my explanation, I know whether they're going to want to invest at Vanguard or RoboAdvisor. <laughs> now, now, maybe it's me and my explanation. Maybe I need to up my game, my salesmanship. But you can just tell some people are like, yeah, okay, I get it. That's interesting. Other people are, are just, you know, their eyes start to go back into their head and they're going down. And that's okay. So um, for them, I've set people up at Betterment. I've set people up at Vanguard. Um, today, I'd probably set someone up at Fidelity or, or, or Schwab. Although if you have just a simple IRA and that's it, man, Vanguard's good. Okay. So for some reason, the uh, I can't show you, well, maybe I can. I've got to talk to the people that at Restream, which is a service I use to stream all of this. <laughs> I like this one from Clownfish. Did you take uh, Nvidia Nvidia gains? I don't own the stock, at least not directly. Right or yeah, I own it through funds. All right. Uh, no, they are not skinny jeans. In fact, they're relaxed fit. A lot of pants today are sold. Uh, you know, I don't squat a lot of weight because of my back. But I'm telling you, pants are designed for guys that don't ever, they skip le leg day all the time. Or maybe I've just got fat legs. I don't know. Okay, that probably falls into the category of too much information. I'm looking for a good question to answer. I'm trying. Um, so Josh wants to know, if I decided to do tax gain harvesting, we'll talk about what that is. Is it best to do this when stock market is down to avoid extra capital gains tax? Does this interrupt or ruin the compound effect? Well, so remember with tax loss harvesting, you own an asset at a loss. Um, you say you've held it longer than a year uh, and you can, or, or not, it could be short term, but you, you sell, you, you paid, you paid hundred bucks, you sell it for 80. You've got that $20 loss but you got to be careful of what's called the wash sale rule. You've got to wait 30 days on either side of that sale. So you can't do this ahead of time before you sell at a loss or after for 30 days before you, you, you're allowed to buy that investment back or you don't get the tax benefit. Now you can buy, you can, you can purchase a very similar but different investment if you want, but otherwise you got to wait that 30 days. That's not true with tax gain harvesting, right? So the idea of tax gain harvesting would be this. You, you bought it at 100 bucks and it's now worth 120 and you want to sell it and you'll get hit with that $20 of, of uh, let's just say, long-term capital gains. And you may be saying, well, Rob, why in the world would I want to do that? Well, uh, particularly if you're, this happens a lot in early retirement where you, you're not, you don't have RMDs yet. You don't have, maybe you're not getting social security yet. You're living off some taxable money. You don't have a lot of income. You could be still within that range of, of, of only of not having to pay any capital gains tax because you're that zero percent capital gains tax bracket uh, is is um, quite generous. Of course, you've got to remember 
ordinary gain, uh, ordinary income can cause your capital gains to push up into higher brackets. Ordinary income can could could result in higher taxes on your capital gains. The other way around is not true. C capital gains cannot cause your your ordinary income to be taxed at a higher rate. I hope that makes sense. If I had my iPad down here, I'd hook it up and I'd draw something for you, but I don't. Uh, you can think of like a little bar chart. Ordinary income is first, and then all your capital gains sit on top. In fact, let me just show you this. Capital, how do you spell capital? Capital gains tax brackets. Let's look at them. We're looking at bank rate. They were the first ones to come up. Here's 2024. So you see this zero rate here. So if you're single up to $47,025, and that's after deductions, right? But you have to remember that if any ordinary income fills this up too. So if you had $20,000 in ordinary income after your deductions, that would only leave you $27,025 that could benefit from this 0% rate. And then anything beyond that would fall into the 15%. Hope that makes sense. And of course, married filing jointly, you got a bigger number. Um, and so there could be times where you go ahead and take the gains because you're not going to pay any taxes. And then you can turn around and buy it, buy it back again. There's no, there's no 30 day, there's no wash sale rule. By the way, whenever I talk taxes, just understand I'm not a tax professional. You should assume I'm wrong. Wash sale rule, uh, Capital gains. I don't see any good good sources to tell you, but the idea of, of the wash sale rule is to basically prevent. Honestly, I think the rule is kind of stupid, but what do I know? Uh, it, it, I guess to be manipulative, but it's not manipulative. And you say, well, you, they don't want you doing things just for tax reasons. We do things all the time just for tax reasons. Anyway. So if you're going to buy it right back, I don't know that it really matters in terms of market valuation. Uh, but again, you should assume I'm wrong about taxes. All right. Yeah, this was an interesting comment that um, uh, Ethan has pointed out. This goes back to the uh, Berkshire Hathaway shareholder letter. There was a change, I think it was in 2018, where you had to recognize as as you know, either income or loss, paper gains or losses on, on securities. And uh, you can tell from any of these letters that Warren Buffett's not a fan of, of that rule, although, of course, Berkshire Hathaway follows it. Uh, and you know it can overstate or understate, in his view, uh, earnings at least you know in a way in, in ways that are unhelpful to investors. But the thing that Ethan points out is that paper gain or loss for Berkshire it can change by five billion a day. Can you imagine logging into you know your your brokerage account and seeing if you're up five billion or down five billion? I guess it's a good problem to have. All right. You know, I did, uh, people are talking about the railroad and how they have suicides and it's just awful. I represented a railroad. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't on that. It was a labor dispute. Labor, actually, he mentioned this in, in, in the letter, uh, heavily, heavily regulated, including their collective bargaining agreements. I used to know the Railroad Labor Act pretty well. I don't anymore. I've forgotten everything that I, I learned. I, this true fact. The case I worked on uh, went, it started and went to an uh, arbitration when I was in the 11th grade. I got through high school, undergrad, law school, started at the firm, and the case was still going on. And I got assigned to it, tried the case with a, a good friend of mine, and he was a partner then. I was an associate at the time. And we won the big issue, lost a smaller one. Um, a lot of fun. Never got to ride the train, though. I've 
very disappointed in that. If you've ever um, been on an Alaska cruise and you've docked at Skagway and you've ridden the train, that's the train. I've been there always in the winter. It's like, it's February. Rob, go to Alaska. I don't know. It's awfully dark. Okay. And cold. All right. Yeah, I do. I have been. I have been a little harebrained tonight. Here and there, back and forth. In this, there's nothing special in this. It's a little caffeine, but so people point this out. This is from Bullseye. Uh, he says, or she says, uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway love companies that pay dividends and create cash. I find this ironic since Berkshire itself does not pay a dividend. Yeah, the one thing I would say though is. Berkshire is a very, very, very different kind of company, right? It's not your typical public company. It, it, you know, it's a collection of companies, and it's run by arguably the best cap, you know, allocator of capital to ever live. Really, I think that's probably a fair statement or one of the best. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting. His comment about dividends this time made me think that maybe they're closer to paying a dividend than, than, than not. By the way, I don't think it's going to happen soon. But, you know, they've got a lot of cash. They need a lot of cash. Uh, and, you know, but I think, you know, I don't think they'll pay a dividend while Warren Buffett's in charge. I would be, I would be surprised because who knows. But, you know, in, in a perfect world, you don't really want that, right? It's not an efficient way to get return of your capital from a tax perspective and a timing. You don't, you know, with dividends, you, you don't get to pick the timing. You don't get to pick the amount. And in a taxable account, you know, you, you get forced to pay taxes. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of good in, in Berkshire not paying a dividend. Jeff wants to know my views of SCHD in a brokerage account. I prefer it. I, I own it in a, um, in my Roth accounts because of the yield. Uh, this is a Schwab uh, fund. I'll show it to everybody. And you can see the yield is three and a half percent. I don't. I just don't want that in my taxable account. I mean, is it the end of the world? I guess it depends on each person's you know particular situation. But I don't. I don't want that uh, in my taxable account. So at least not in any, you know, significant amounts. So I prefer it. Um, huh. I have not seen this. So Benjamin says, did you see Ben Felix video entitled how bonds are hurting your retirement? Although if this is the whole 100% equity in that research paper, I'm not buying it. And I, I listened to, it's two weeks ago. Conventional wisdom and popular personal financial advice. Is this the paper? Let me just see if he's referencing that paper. Yeah, the Cedarberg paper. So there's a paper out there. There was first, I think it was, I, I think he's using the same data that this professor, um, and I haven't, I'll, I'll put this paper on my site in, in the directory at, at some point, but um he concluded that like a safe withdrawal rate is much, much lower than 4%. Uh, and then he's come out and said, you should be hundred percent stocks, uh, maybe split between U S and international and that owning bonds hurts retirement outcomes, but the data, and I've not, I've skimmed the second paper. So I I'm not a hundred percent positive. It's using the same data set. Um, I'll show it to you. Here's the paper. Maybe this isn't the paper, actually. Same author, but it's a different paper. In any event, oh wait, maybe this is it. Yeah, I clicked on the wrong one. Yeah, this is the paper. And I, I'm very suspicious. Uh, the way, and I'm, I'm sure I can't do it justice, and I'm sure that this won't be completely accurate, but in, a, in broad strokes, the thought was, look, the 4% rule was based on U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds. And yes, the U.S. has had a great run 
for whatever, 100 years or whatever, I guess since, certainly since World War II. And, um, but, you know, there's a lot of countries that didn't do so well, and there's no reason to believe that uh, the United States will do just as well over the next whatever, 50, 7,500 years. And so you need to have an international perspective, but it's the way in which he, they did it. Uh, because to me, the thing to do would be to say, okay, well, let's take someone who invests globally. So like a VT, which is a Vanguard ETF that invests uh, throughout the world, U.S. and, and non-U.S., uh, based on you know uh, a, a cap-weighted index like the S&P 500 or total stock market, but this covers the, the globe. Now, VT hasn't been around that long, right? If we go to Portfolio Visualizer, we'll see. I don't know how how long VT has been around. Not that long though, I don't think. Let's see here. We'll go to portfolio, go to VT. Hmm. I know it's there. Let's see what happens if I just type it in and hit analyze. Yeah, well, since 2009. Okay, but still that's not, you know, that's not that long. Um, but it would seem to me, why not analyze withdrawal strategy based on that sort of global approach to investing. And you, you'd have to come up with the data. You have to go back longer than 2009, of course. Uh, and, and maybe it's not possible. I don't know. But that would seem to me to be the way to do it. Maybe because of data, though, that's not how they do it. And that's not how like um, uh, Wade Fowle has done a paper on this, 2010. That one I, I either have in the draft or it will be in my directory. Uh, but but Cedarberg's paper, as I recall, what they did was they took all countries that were classified as developed, which, by the way, may make sense. In the you might say, well, that's good because we're sort of comparing apples to apples. You know, the U.S. is a developed country, so. But when you look at the list, you're like, yeah, that's not really apples to apples. I mean, we, they might all be in the developed countries bucket, but nah, they're not really apples to apples. But then they 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 broke it apart month by month for returns data and inflation data. And then used it to, to construct massive amounts of um, simulations, and it's it's like no one can invest that way. It doesn't exist, and it, you know, and you're 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 including countries, of course, that were ravaged by World War One or World War Two. And I get it. You could say anything could happen in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure how helpful that is, um, and I'm certainly not going to base my investing decisions on that kind of analysis. Anyway, that's my, it's on my to-do list to really thoroughly examine that paper, but I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really buying it right now. Now, I haven't listened to, I mean, Felix, Ben Felix is great. I haven't listened to that video and I will later. R. Miller says, started the back mechanic book, Rob, retired cop. Thank you for your service. With two prior back surgeries, hmm. good read so far. You know, I've I've haven't been to a, a an orthopedist for my back or had an MRI in 15 years. Uh, I really want to hold off on surgeries, but I don't know. Maybe I I should look into it. Anyway, okay. David says, would you still recommend, and I'm going to stand up for a second just to stretch. Oh, would you still recommend a lump sum investment for a windfall given the current CAPE ratio? Now it's around 34. Um, my first question to you would be, if you're not going to do lump sum, what are you going to do? And if you say uh, maybe dollar cost average over six months or 12 months, I would say do whatever you're comfortable with. I, you know. It's probably, you know, we don't know ahead of time which one's going to work out. Um, and, you know, I would lump sum is what I would do. But, you know, I, the, the thing, and Paul Merriman pointed this out to me. We were having a phone call. This was a, at least a year ago. And he, his concern with telling everyone lump sum just because statistically that seems to work out more often than, than dollar cost averaging although the studies don't really take into account valuations, which is your point in your question. But he, he said, look, you know, if someone lump sums and then they get, they get, you know, the market's down 20%, it could really psychologically just crush them in a way that if the dollar cost average in and the market goes up and maybe they missed some of those returns, it's probably not going to affect them the same way. 
And I think I always thought that that was a good point that, that Paul made. Norse mythology wants to know about an ETF called XT. I have no idea. Sounds like a street drug. Exponential technologies. Seven, uh, the yield is 7, uh, 0.7. It costs 46 basis points. Exponential. 200 holdings. So all I know about it is what you've just seen on your screen. I guess my question would be why this fund? What is the goal of owning this fund? You know, my default is broad market index funds that are inexpensive. So now I, I, this is going to cost me 46 basis points. Um, it's going to overlap, in my case, my total U.S. stock market uh, fund, but it's going to tilt it towards growth and towards tech. Why? What's the goal? Um, I suppose you might want technology. But you've got a lot of tech in a total U.S. stock market. I mean, if you go to VTI and you go to portfolio and you go to sectors, you know, technology is 30%. And in some ways, technology is a part of every other sector. I don't know. I, I don't, I mean, I, I can't say whether it's a good fund or bad fund. I think my question would be, what, what purpose will it serve in your portfolio? So Raddy says deadlifts can really help your back. Not mine. Deadlifts are my Achilles heel. I can't do them. I could do a deadlift with maybe a kettlebell, but I can't lock my, you know, with a barbell, you're locking your arms into a position relative to each other. You're locking your shoulders uh, in. Um, and and it's just, it's just, uh, I mean, and I've tried, you know, I've tried trap bar, elevated, and yeah. It's just not good. All right. What do we have? So Gordon says the first season of True Detective was the best. It was scary. There was a, what, what was the, um, What's the guy? I forget his name. I played in uh, Hangover, I think, right? Between Two Ferns guy. He has Matthew McConaughey on that. This was, I'm sure, years ago. And there were some questions about True Detective that were really funny. I spent too much time on YouTube. Okay. All right. This is a great question. Is it worth it to invest in dividend ETFs when you can get 5% on cash with no risk? So there's actually risk in the 5% cash on 5% on cash. Uh, and it's reinvestment risk, right? It, which is just a, a fancy and probably silly way to say the 5% ain't guaranteed tomorrow. Now, um, and it's going to go up or down and for a lot of different reasons could depend on what the Fed does and other things. Um, but the 5% on cash is great compared to what it used to be. Uh, and um, I certainly own my share of T-bills for money that my wife and I plan to spend in the next 12 months. And they're earning roughly 5%. Uh, but uh, we don't know what it's going to be tomorrow or next month or next year. Uh, dividend ETFs... Uh, Pay if you think think like the SCHD that we we looked at for example as a dividend fund, it was what we what was it three and a half percent something like that I don't even remember now. Yeah, three and a half percent. But 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 here's what you have to just at least appreciate the fundamental difference between owning a company and owning a bond or fixed income or cash. Let's assume, let's even assume the, 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 the 5%, you get a CD and it's good for two or three years. Uh, that's what you're going to get, right? Not a nickel more. The idea of owning companies, of course, is we hope that over time, 
they grow their, their, their revenue and their profits. Your dividend yield may never, like SCHD, this yield will probably never come up to 5%. Well, it could for short periods of time if we had a big market crash. Uh, but but the but that wouldn't the, the 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 yield in terms of dollars wouldn't have changed. It's just when you do the math, the yield goes up because the price has gone down. But the but the point is, as as companies do well and they can pay more and more dividends, what happens to the price? It goes up, so it keeps their yield sort of within a certain range. Uh, but but the dollars you're getting are, are greater, right? Uh, as the company can pay more and more because it has more and more profit. So. Uh, long term, uh, you're going to end up. I think uh, plus you've got the the, the uh, appreciation of the underlying value of the stock. So uh, that's not to say that you know fixed income, cash, bonds, obviously have an important are important place in a portfolio depending on your, on your goals. But you can't, in my view, you can't simply look at the interest rate and compare it to the dividend yield and then make a judgment as to which one's better or worse because they're just they're totally different. They they function differently. They behave differently over longer periods of time. Uh, yeah, that's my take. All right. Han has a question. Let me see if I can get through this one. How would you order? How would your order of spin down, meaning to, which accounts you spend first, to account for large pre tax balances, so traditional, let's say a traditional IRA, with the reality that one spouse will survive and have to file single. Any tools to take that tax? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, um, so let's put the question in context. And actually we can do that. Let's see here. The tax rates, federal, we're talking about federal now, right? Are of course very different for those married filing uh, jointly and singles, right? So if we look at uh, this is fidelity, this is 22, 23, 24. So like let's just take the 24% bracket for a single filer, it's it's 100 to 191, but if you're married filing jointly, it's 200 to almost 400, right? So you could be married and thinking you know you've got you know, let's say you make 383,000 taxable. You're in the 24% tax bracket, but then if one of one spouse passes away, is that the question? Yeah, uh, or you know, divorce too. But um, the following year, that 383 is going to put you not only into the 32, but actually the 35% tax bracket. Right? Big, big difference. So, how can you model that? Uh, well, new retirement does it. Let me see if I can log in. That's not what I wanted. I hit the wrong button. Try it again here. Here we go. So this is my demo account. Let me make sure it's my demo account. Yes, it's my demo account. And um, I don't know. I think I think the demo. Yeah, they're, so they're they're married, uh, or I have I have a I've, I've modeled a married couple. Uh, they're both in their sixties. They're going to live to be their nineties. Uh, but what you could do um, is we've got this base plan, right? We could create a scenario. And add a new scenario. We'll call it early checkout. <laughs> I don't know. You probably want to call it something different than that. Or if you call it that, don't let your spouse see it. No, I'm kidding. Don't keep secrets. You guys should be doing this together. And then you can you can run this, and we can change. We can we can we can plan for that, right? We can say that this spouse isn't going to live to be 98. They're going to live to be, I don't know, pick a number, 73. And you can see just doing that alone changed this plan. It, it, our, we've, we've lost, at the end of the surviving spouse at, at age 95, they've lost two and a half million. Um, now, and, and they're paying 84,000 more in lifetime taxes. Uh, now, the loss here is probably from... One would be Social Security. I don't know. I think I I think I just uh, had the lower earning spouse die early. So you, anyway, you're going to lose some Social Security either way. Um, you could dive into the details and you can compare plans too. Um, but yeah, you could use something like new retirement. 
Uh, you could probably use Projection Lab. I assume it would do something similar, although I like the tax analysis of new retirement better, although it's not perfect. Um, you could use Maxify. I think you can create that scenario, and Maxify is another one. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Samit says, why do you prefer to keep your international portion at 20% instead of 40? Isn't 80% of your stock portfolio in the U.S. too much of a concentrated risk? Well, it's an argument. What should it be? I mean, if we go to VT for a second, which is just a global allocation, right? I think it's about 55% U.S. 60. So globally, international is 38 um, I guess that's your point, 40. I could just buy VT. Um, you know, one of the arguments would be uh, that, you know, with the S&P 500 and whatnot, um, we'll go back to this, you're getting um, plenty of international exposure, right? Apple does business all over the world, as does Microsoft, as does Exxon, and on and on. Is Exxon a U.S. company? Yeah, I think it is. Anyway, um, of course, one could use that argument to say you don't need any specific U.S. allocate or international allocation. Uh, that's sort of J.L. Collins' view, I think, right? Simple path to wealth. I think he's all U.S. I'm just not comfortable doing that. So I just got to a point where that's what I was comfortable with. Alte says, what do you think about trying out retirement for a few years between jobs, maybe a decade before retirement? If you can do it, I think it's great. That's effectively kind of what I've done. I've kind of gone into retirement, then back out, then back in. Now I'm out. Probably be back in soon. And and by retirement, I mean um, needing to live off of your savings or a, a large part of your expenses coming from savings. It doesn't mean you don't really do anything for, for income. Um, I mean, def that definitely the definition of retirement has changed, but I think there's a lot of good that could come out of that for a lot of reasons. If you have a time to take, you know, an extended sabbatical. I didn't really, I mean, I had that opportunity eventually, uh, but like in the practice of law, I mean, I guess you could do anything, but it would be tough. It would be tough to, to be out for a couple of years and then get back in, at least with the kind of law that I practiced. You know, you're at a big firm to get out and then go back in two years later, unless you had a big book of business that was just willing to come back to you. It would be tough. Hmm. Joseph says, retiring this year at 56, pension pays half of expenses, Social Security at 70 will overpay. Well, that's good. New retirement Roth scenario is recommending a complete conversion of 401k to a Roth IRA. Well, what doesn't make sense to me about that is that you're going to have RMDs on your 401k, right? Or if you move it over to a traditional IRA, you're going to have RMDs um, eventually. I guess it, under current law, given your age, I think I think it'll be when you turn 75. Um, and so the one of the ideas on a, on a Roth conversion is that you want to want to bring down the tax brackets that you'll get hit with. Once you start RMDs, particularly in your case, where you you know the Social Security will cover all your expenses with your pension, and but but you can over convert right where where you end up lowering your in this case to zero. There's no RMDs, but then to do that, you get hit with higher tax brackets early. I don't know how much is in your 401k. Maybe you're able to convert it at very 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 low taxes, and so why not convert the whole thing? I don't know. But I would be looking, I'll show you what I'd be looking at. Um, and if you're using their tool, so I'll, I'll go back to new retirement. You have these Explorer tools down here that include a Roth conversion Explorer. But there's no way, unless they've added the feature uh, since last I checked, there's no way to take the results of that and automatically zap it into your plan. Instead, you've got to go to money flows and do Roth conversions manually. And when you do that, you're going to see 
your taxes, this is uh, here, net taxable income by federal tax bracket. Um, this actually was from a video I did a week ago that, that you may have watched, but you can, you'll be able to see how conversions, in fact, we can just do another one real quick. Um, well, I, this was, um, I was doing, I was withdrawing, but we could, we could model a Roth conversion too, right? We could come in here and say, we're going to go from retirement savings. We're going to take 35,000 and we'll do this, uh, in 2026, uh, and eh, we'll make this nine and this five and we'll save it. And you see, we've got, we're, we're going to get taxed, but it also lowered what's going to get hit at 25%, right? And we can come up here, by the way, and see the impact on the plan up here. But my point is, if you keep doing that, you know, 27, 28, 29, eventually all this 25% tax bracket is going to get, be gone uh, or most of it perhaps. And increasing this even further could end up being counterproductive. I hope that makes sense. So I would be keeping an eye on, on the, the, the tax insights in new retirement as you actually map out the amounts and years of the Roth conversions you're going to do. Also, ask new retirement. They're great at, at responding. So... Whew, what time is it? 8.06. All right. DC Newark One asks, if bond ETFs can lose value, but an individual bonds, but individual bonds held until maturity will always return its yield, why not ladder bond holdings? Well, part of it depends on your holding period. Um it's certainly true that that and we're, let's talk about investment grade maybe US government bond funds. Obviously if you're talking about junk bonds, they can lose money cuz companies are unable to pay back the, the the loans, right? In other words, there's credit risk. But let's just deal with US government bonds that which as a practical matter takes out credit risk. We'll put aside the political discussion about whether our country will ever default on it won't, right? Cuz it can just it's they're dollar denominated loans, right? Anyway, we'll just assume they're not going to default. Uh, so we don't have credit risk. So, you know, if you buy into a fund, let's just say a lump sum into a, a U.S. government treasury intermediate term or long-term treasury fund that's paying 3%, uh, we know that it can lose money in the short term. We just have to think back to, what, 2022 for that. But long-term, we know that it's, it's not going to because uh, at least over a certain period of time, that's usually roughly two times the duration of the, the fund, um, which is a figure you can look up in Morningstar. We can go to, um, we'll just look at um, BND, which we look at a lot. We can go, this is about six and a half duration, I'd say. Yeah, 6.37. You could think of it as sort of the weighted average time it'll take you to get get your, your money back on a bond. In this case, it's, a, it's an average of the, the fund. Um, if you if you think about that number times two minus one, so you're talking 11 years, let's say, your return should be roughly the current yield, which is four and a half percent. And part of the reason, one way to think about that is, yes, if 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 interest rates go up, right, the value of the bond fund will go down. That's bad, but eventually the fund will actually benefit from those higher yields because it's constantly buying and selling to keep its duration at roughly that, that six and a half. So yeah, it'll sell maybe lower yielding uh, bonds or, or bonds at a loss, but when it, it replaces them, it'll, it'll get that better price, which effectively gives it a higher yield. And over time, it sort of makes up for that loss. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's, but but with an individual bond, another way to think about an individual bond is you have paper losses, right? If I buy a 10-year U.S. Treasury and, and interest rates skyrocket, the value of my bond is going to go down. Now, I can choose not to sell it, and I'm not running a bond mutual fund or ETF that's trying to maintain a certain maturity. So I don't have to sell and buy and sell and buy. I can just hold it. But I may be holding that thinking, man, I wish I didn't own it, <laughs> Right. I bought a 2% 10-year, it's now 5%. And I'm stuck with this 2% for another seven years. But I haven't 
realized that loss. If that makes you feel better, okay. Doesn't really make me feel better. The other thing is with a bond ladder, you know, I, I got to put some work into it. I've got to constantly be making sure I've got the right overall duration maturity for this ladder. And it's not, I guess, that difficult. You know, you, you have a bond ladder that's, you know, you got 10 bonds for a 10-year bond ladder. Yeah, you're buying and selling uh, or it gets, your money gets returned to you and you buy a new bond once a year or a series of bonds. Yeah, maybe not the end of the world. But um, I think the, the better way for me to look at this is it depends on your, your goal. Uh, I think bond ladders are great, like to bridge Social Security. If you're going to retire at 65, but you want to hold off on Social Security until you're 70 and you really want the comfort of tips because you get inflation protected and you want to create a five-year tips bond ladder uh, that will cover your expenses for those five years, I think that makes a lot of sense. You're, 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 you've got a very specific time frame. You're targeting these funds. I think that's you know uh, um, sensible. On the other hand, if you've just got an overall portfolio, you're going to draw from it, rebalance every year, and it, it, you know you, you're planning for a 30-year retirement, or maybe you're you know you're even not even retired yet, and you're looking at 40, 50 years. I think for me, a bond ladder is just a hassle. I I don't even I'm just okay with BND or some other fund. Doesn't have to be BND. Anyway, that's my take. All right. Mike says, for Warren Buffett's 90-10 portfolio, for those that aren't familiar, he said this in a uh, in a shareholder letter a number of years ago. 2014? I don't know. Uh, that he liked the 90% S&P 500, 10% short-term treasuries. And this question, Mike says, well, why the 10%? Why not zero? I don't know. I, I am tentatively, my wife doesn't know this yet. Uh, she's not listening, by the way. Anyway, uh, and Matt, don't tell her. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting this year. So if people are going, we ought to like, I don't know, get together. Take, take the convention center by storm. Maybe get dinner. Uh, and maybe one of us could get up and ask a question, and we can ask him this question. Although my question, if I got a chance to ask Warren Buffett a question based on his current letter, it would be, what did you notice that in 2019 that led you to believe that Japan and these five companies were good investments? And after 30 years of, yeah, in Japan economically, what did you notice? What, what did you see that no one else saw? But this would be a good question, too. Maybe the if I had to guess, it would be the ten percent is there for emergencies, safety nets. You know, he's not a he's never been one to not hold cash. Eh, that'd be my guess. Okay, I just love this channel. You guys are talking about Irma and RMDs. Mom's and mom's watching. Mom, I love you too. She says, "Love you, mom." Big heart. Yeah, Noreen stresses that Rob Berger is not a tax professional. Thank you. And Neil says, he is a tax lawyer. See, you should listen to Neil, not me. I've always thought, by the way, if I if I could do it over again, I, I went as a litigator. And I had an opportunity, at least to apply, I don't know if I got an offer, to apply for the Justice Department's tax division. And one of the nice things, as I recall, now this was, you know, more than 30 years ago, was that you could, you could get a lot of trial experience in that div specific division of the Justice Department, but the pay was terrible. And I had law school loans, but I, I always thought I would be a good tax lawyer, but I'm not. Neil is. Okay. Okay, so this is a great question from RJ. Love your channel. Thank you. Me, my wife, 61, 59, retiring in one to two years, currently low single digit bond mix, looking to grow it. Thoughts on asset location to grow bond mix for high tax family. I, to me, it should be in retirement accounts. Traditional retirement accounts is to me the, the number one place. You can own some municipal bond funds in a taxable account. Um, you know, I wouldn't 
personally, I wouldn't get too crazy with how much I put in muni funds. Uh, I think the best place for, a, and, and the reason, so why a traditional? So it, it shields the, the income from taxes, at least for now, right? So you're not getting hit with taxes every year uh, if it's in a taxable account. And uh, we know long-term that they're not going to grow as much, or at least we don't, we don't think they will, as stocks will. And I, so I'd rather have them in traditional since I'm going to, particularly if you have, as you said, um, high tax family, you know, you're going to have RMDs to deal with. So I'd rather have my, my I'm not, I'm not going to invest in, in assets that have a lower expected return just to keep my RMDs low. But if I think these assets are an important part of my portfolio, and for bonds, I do, I'd rather have them in the traditional accounts uh, so that you know, they, they don't increase my RMDs as much. And then for stocks, stocks can go in traditional or, or taxable, or and and I try to put I do put all stocks in my Roth. In our case, our Roths unfortunately aren't that much of our money is in Roth. So I wish more were, but anyway. All right. So this is an interesting question from. Stephen, do you set your taxable accounts for first in, first out? Meaning the first stocks uh, that you bought are the first ones you sell. And you can pick the lots. There's different ways to do it. Um, I don't have to deal with this very often because I don't sell very much. Uh, there have been times uh, a long time ago when I selected specific lots. I haven't done that in a very long time. I actually sold something this year. Remember, my goal this year was not to sell anything. Although one of the exceptions is, you know, you need the money. Uh, it was a very small amount, but I needed the money. But I sold the whole investment, so I didn't have to worry about it. Um, and I was able to do it in a way that there wouldn't be any taxes. So, but I, I, you know, it just depends on the circumstances and what you're trying to achieve from a tax perspective. There's no right way to do it, I don't think. Uh, yeah. All right. How are we doing on time? 8.17. Let's see. What's this? Mid-America Mom. For FI Calc, Hebler, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, approach, connect with new retirement folks. Hmm. I don't know what that means. Let's see here. So this is FI Calc. Hebler. So one thing about this is I'll be adding all of these withdrawal strategies to my site, right? Oh, I realize you can't see what I'm looking at. Hang on. There we go. Hebler Autopilot 2, which you know, raises a question. What was autopilot one? I don't know. Uh, but you can click it and then you can read about this strategy. Henry Hebler, the withdrawal for each year is 75% of the previous year withdrawal combined with 25% of the withdrawal determined by the PMT formula. I have no idea what that is. But I'll figure it out. But I don't know what the connection is with new retirement. But it's interesting. I'll know more about that hopefully in the next in the next live live uh, Q and A. All right. Nor Noreen says, "Now this was 50, uh, 30, 40 minutes ago. High energy tonight, Rob. Yeah, I guess so. I missed you guys and gals. Guys is sort of a generic term. Well, maybe it's not." I don't know. It was, so, it was simpler when I was in, in, in grade school. All right. Hmm. Jeremy, please talk about stru strategies, I guess, to create a paycheck in retirement, like sell in November to fill up cash for next year, then rebalance. What about dividends paid out next year 
in taxable accounts. So here's how I think about it. Now I'm not at the moment in needing to do this exactly, but here's how I, but I will be probably maybe even later this year. The way I would do it is um, in my taxable accounts, all of the dividends would get automatically put into whatever cash account or whatever broker y- you have um, and, um, and spent, right? Now, if you need more money than that, and of course, let's assume you're not at RMD age yet, and maybe you're not even getting Social Security, but even if you are, whatever, obviously, if you are getting RMDs and Social Security, and you know that might be enough. But if you need more beyond dividends for whatever your circumstances are, then the question becomes, uh, you know, you got to sell shares. I think that's sort of obvious. Uh, you're going to have to pick where they're going to come from, which account type. When I did a video on this just uh, a week ago, uh, and it may be taxable accounts, but maybe not, depending on your tax s- circumstances and other factors. But let's just assume it's taxable. You're going to you're going to sell shares. In my case, what I would probably do is sell uh, quarterly. It's probably would be my p- plan. I think um, you know it's easy to do, and I, once a quarter. Now I would. Having said that, I'm going to have some kind of an emergency fund in cash, uh, or it could be T-bills. Um, some of it, though, would be in cash because it's going to take, a, I think, a couple of days to get access to your money um, through T-bills. But, you know, the other way you could do it is a line of credit. Um, uh, just to, if you need an emergency money while some transactions were, were clearing, right? Uh, but I think I'm going to do it probably quarterly could do it twice a year, as you said, once a year. Um, and, and that's just how it's going to work. So, you know, when I, if you did it once a year in November and you said, well, I'm going to get these dividends, you, you, you know, roughly what they're going to be. So you could just factor those in, you know, roughly when you're, you're you know, exactly when you're going to get them. And then you could, you could sell whether it's yearly or some other time frame, to just to make up whatever the difference is that you need. I think that that's my plan. Huh. Trying to think about missing anything. Hmm. From DAA Crusher 2001. What would your advice be for a new retiree that has shifted to 100% fixed income and plans to stay that way through the bridge years before taking Social Security? Income is enough to cover all expenses. Well, I don't know what your specific question is. I mean, I take it you've got interest if you say income is enough to cover all your expenses. At 100% fixed income, you're getting interest that covers your expenses. I, I guess I don't know what the question is. It's an interesting approach, one that I've not I've not seen others take. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's I generally sort of shy away from these massive changes in asset allocation, but particularly if this is in a uh, retirement account, you know, you you don't incur taxes from these big asset allocation changes in a taxable account. I would never do that. And I, well, unless you could do it, you didn't have gains, but that's interesting approach. I, I will say it's nice that you can live off just the income. Just trying to learn something wants to know if Ohio State football is going to win win it all this year. They win it all every year. At least that's the world I like to live in. If Warren Buffett is the greatest investor, how much of his investments are international? That's a good question. I mean, he's got, you know, Berkshire owns uh, quite a few international investments, but I don't know, like, as a percentage, I don't know. That's a good question. He clearly believes in the U.S. He's long on the U.S. That's for sure. All right. Dean wants to know if I ever switched my cash to Fidelity Cash Management. He says, I switched to Fidelity at the beginning of the year and joined it. I haven't yet. Um, I think there's a, a good chance I will at some point, but not in the immediate f- future. Uh, there's just, it doesn't, with the business and stuff, it doesn't make sense. Um, 
I think I'll probably do that when I start taking from retirement accounts. Uh, I'll switch to, but I don't know when that's going to be. It's not in the near future. At least as far as I know, it's not. Here's an interesting question from Vinyl. Which countries do you think will do better than the U.S.? Here's the point. I have no earthly idea. No clue. I, but I, I don't believe the U.S. will be the number one economy forever. How will it end? I don't know. Which one will end us? I don't know. Because, you know, if we become number two someday, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Certainly having the dollar is sort of the, the, the you know, the currency that's used in throughout the world helps. Well, and, and, and certainly other countries' willingness to buy our debt, that helps a lot too. But yeah, I have no idea. I certainly, I, I certainly question how a country of what do we got, 335 million can be the economic powerhouse forever against, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I'm not betting against the U.S., but I'm just saying, I, you know, can't last forever. Oh, this is interesting from Mike on that paper I was talking about. He said, Scott did not recommend anything. He simply demonstrated that global diversification is better than diversification into bonds over long horizons. Well, that may be. I, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, the, although I then I would say people are interpreting the paper wrong because everyone's sort of interpreted it as retirees shouldn't be in bonds. All right. So Aaron's got some uh, myofacial release. Well, dry needling. I mean, I've been there. Hello. I remember the first time a physical therapist uh, in uh, near where I live. I haven't seen him for a, a while now, but um, he tried dry needling on me. And, you know, I mean, eventually, I mean, it's a little nerve wracking, you know, uh, but boy, it is, it is effective. But all of these things don't solve the problem. I mean, they, they, they help, but they're not like fixing. They don't fix you. They give you some relief, but I've done, I've done everything. Cupping acupuncture, dry needling, stem. Uh, yeah. All right, we're almost to the end. I will do, I'll, I'll tell you what, while I'm looking for the last few questions, I will put up on the screen a chess problem. I'll log into my account at chess.com. By the way, if anyone wants to play me, my username is Roller. Um, I don't know what my rating is now. My rating fluctuates. I tend to play three-minute speed chess. My rating is 1861. It fluctuates between low 1800s and low 2000s. Yeah. What are you telling me? All right, we'll put up a puzzle. Okay. That's my puzzle rating. And they've just moved king to, to f4. We're, we're black. So check that out. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a second. To, I haven't, I'll look at it in just a second. Let me just see if I can find maybe one last question to end the show on. It can be a non-finance question. Here's one. Will we ever see the other side of your office? I mean, it's not really much to look at. I'm in a finished basement. We have this big bar. It, you know, it's a beautiful bar, actually. And there's a, a, a dishwasher and a, those refrig a half refrigerator under the counter and a sink and this beautiful wood bar. Um, and we don't drink. <laughs> I mean, we don't, it's not that we never have alcohol, but it's rare and we don't drink at home. I guess I could show you that. I'd have to get my, uh, I'd have to get it set up. All right. I do, whoops, I do, hang on. I do have a list of low-cost financial advisors on the site, and it's actually another directory that I'm going to create to more formalize it. Um, but you should be able to find that. 
email me if you have trouble. Actually, I think if you just Google low cost financial advisors, I think I'm on the first page, low cost financial advisor. I think I'll show up somewhere on the first page. Yeah. I'm looking at on my other computer that you can't see, but. All right. Oh, yeah. Sheldon talks about Stuart McGill's big three. I do them every day, almost every day. Um, they are, uh, here, I'll take this off for just a second. So I do a cat and camel. The one thing he says about cat and camel is that you're not really supposed to push end of range. The point of cat and camel is just the motion itself, which I'd never appreciated. But then you do bird dog. You know, you're on all fours, one arm, leg, uh, the other way. Um, hold it for 10 seconds. Do He does sets of six, four, and then two. Uh, and then uh, what else did he do? He has a certain McGill a crunch where you've, you're basically just lifting your shoulders off the floor. You can also uh, do stir the pot, which was the Swiss ball. So that's what I do a lot where you're up, you're kind of doing a plank on the Swiss ball and you're doing this kind of slowly. And then uh, a side plank, or I just do sort of, I like the idea of a rolling plank where you're like this and then you roll up on one side and then back. But I was carrying kettlebells today, suitcase carries, marching in place. It's funny. I can I can carry a thirty five pound kettlebell as you know on one side and march up and down. But then if I try to stand up, it's like oh that hurts. So oh, that wasn't too bad. Anyway, all right. For those that want to hang around, we'll do a couple of chess problems. I know I didn't get to everything, not even close, and I never do. Anyway, let's put this chess problem back up. So when I look at this, my first thought is we got to checkmate the king, right? The king is in some trouble. And my first thought is just G5, right? Push it and check. The king, the king, uh, of course, you can take. I'll just take back. The king can't go to this row, right? Because my queen can't go here because of the queen. Uh, can go here, but then I'll just bring my queen down as checkmate. I don't know. Oh, I, I see now. I didn't, I was thinking he would go here. I didn't think he would take it. But that's still checkmate, so it's okay. All right. We'll do another one. I'll let you think on that while I try to find one last question. By the way, did you guys get that one right? I should go down to the bottom of the chat. Did anyone guess that? One, one guess, queen f6 for, the, for a perpetual. Queen c1. Queen to queen's level three. Oh, that's got to be the best answer. Oh, yeah. Um, Ethan got it. Pawn to G5. All right. Here's a question from Kelly. When you donated Apple shares, do you donate them directly or through a, a, a donor-advised fund? We always use a donor-advised fund. And then that way we can divide it up, uh, contribute when we want to. Uh, not all charities are set up to easily accept stock, so that, that's an issue. You know, you put it in a donor-advised fund, you can invest it, whether it's Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, into their funds. And then if you want to send a check out uh, to a charity, they just cash in some shares and send out a check. Uh, so we always use a donor-advised fund. Keep in mind that you can only deduct, I think, I think, and in, in, in Neil, is that his name, Neil? The tax lawyer, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I may have gotten his name wrong. Sorry. 30% uh, of your of your AGI. So you can't give more than 30% than of your AGI. Well, you can. I guess it would carry over maybe the next year. Most people aren't given 30% of their AGI. So maybe it's not a, a big deal. I don't know. Okay, back to the problem. So we're white. We're, we got the white pieces. The black has just moved here. One of the things I look at before I start trying to calculate is um, uh, are there any pieces hanging, like the undefended, right? And so there's a piece here that's not defended, the rook. Uh, this piece is defended, but it's also in a somewhat odd location. I suppose it's attacking this pawn. Of course, we're defending. Um, and, and then I look at king safety. To me, the king looks fairly safe there, given the pieces that we have. We had a white squared bishop or, of course, a queen on that diagonal. That would be 
a totally different thought. Um, my the first thing that my eye draws to in this position is, and let me take the comment down, is taking this pawn, right? Because if the king takes, then I check here, pick up the rook. Now, normally a rook and a pawn versus um for two knights, eh, I'm not sure I would do it. Um the thing I have to be worried about, though, I, I guess that's not I'm, all I'm doing is trading down to four pawns versus four pawns. So that might not be so good. Plus, you want to be careful because he can push this if those knights are gone. And I can't take with this pawn because he would win the rook, right? Um, so I'm not sure that, that maybe that's maybe not the best. Of course, I could always just attack the rook right away here. Uh, I don't know if I like that either. Well, this is kind of interesting. If I attack the, the rook here, I'm also trying to attack this pawn. Um, if he brings his rook up to defend the pawn, knight here forks these two rooks. That's a thought. Of course, he could always defend it from here, but it, it puts his rook in a pretty um, conservative spot. Hmm. This one's not obvious to me. This is why I always marvel at chess players at stream because they're able to to entertain people and 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 talk and analyze at the same time. I can't talk and analyze at the same time. Also, I'm not sure the value of winning this pawn. Um, Actually, as I think about it, if I move my knight here, oh, he can't, he can't, he can pin, he can pin my knight, but I can just take this pawn with the other knight. Um, okay, let's see what you guys came up with. Rook to c1. Well, you could think about at some point maybe pushing this pawn, but I don't see what this does immediately. I, I like to threaten things if possible. It's very aggressive, I know. Knight f6, so it attacks this pawn. Of course, he could go back. What's it threaten after that? Not sure. What else we got? Knight f6, then knight f7. Well, that's true. If I go back, he can fork the rooks. Yes, I like that. Because if I go here, either way, he can fork the rooks. I think that's it. You guys are brilliant. That's what I'm going to do. We'll see. Oh, look. Ah. Yeah. Very nice. All right, we'll do one more, then I'm going to call it a night. So we're in check. We've got three options. Um. If we come back here, he can't check me again here because of the knight. Uh, if we come here, he's got more checks. Doesn't mean it's wrong. If we come here, he's got the knight check. That doesn't look great. Of course, moving the king is going to put his queen under attack. Uh... Huh. So you guys will probably come up with the right answer, uh, uh, and I won't. But but here's what I'm ultimately thinking about. Uh, if we if we step here for for a moment, he's really only got one move for the queen, right? He's got to go here. Oh, actually, we might want to go here. Here's what I'm looking at. He's got to move here because this bishop. It's going to hit the queen in this diagonal, and he can't go here because of the pawns, right? He can't not going to take the knight and lose the queen. Um, once he goes here, though, I can push this pawn, attacking the queen. I guess he could go all the way over here. No, he can't because the, the I've pushed this pawn. The queen would would take him. He could go all the way over here. 
Maybe that's his answer. What I'm trying to think about is eventually a knight here threatening to fork the, the king and the rook. I was hoping to force his queen to this square. Knight here, queen has to move, and I can take that pawn, but I don't think I'm quite there. He goes here. Oh, yes, I am. Okay. I think it's I think it's king to c7. The point is, if I go here, he comes back, and I push this pawn, he can just take... No, he can't take that pawn. Huh. I still think this is the right move because then he might have a check here that I don't want to deal with. Because now I can go here. He goes here, and then I immediately move the knight here, attacking the queen and threatening the pawn. So that's my thinking. It's king here. How many people are still? 587 of you. You guys really like chess. All right. Do we have a? Has anyone tried this puzzle? What do we have any answers? Nothing. Well, I'm moving the king. We'll see. Yes. Whoo. By the way, you get a big eh, you know, red X if it's wrong. And then um, I think it's this, right? Yeah. And then there we go. Three in a row. Well. I got two of them. You guys got one. I guess you guys didn't care about this last one. I don't know. Ethan thinks I should turn Dough Roller into a chess channel. I could. Will Ohio State beat Michigan next year? I mean, I, I've given up. I don't know. They've lost their coach. He ran. Um, I have no idea what kind of team we're going to field. Uh, quarterback questions. I'm not thrilled with our coach. Oh, wait. Pain care. Hang on. 38 years as a pain management physician here. Low back is not a surgeon issue. Okay. Commonly comes from facet joints. See an interventional pain doc and look into regenerative medicine treatments. So the, the chiropractor that I'm going to, I just went to him once. Um, he recommended a regenerative, I think this is correct, medicine treatment. Um, or, you know, a doctor that does that in the area. And I probably will reach out to him. Yeah. All right, gang. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out with me and even tolerating the chess positions. I guess some of you really like chess. Um, 12 minutes overtime. Yeah. I charge time and a half for overtime. All right. Have a great week. Let's see. Will I be back in two weeks for this thing? Lord willing and the creek don't rise? Yeah, I think so. That's the plan. And I'll have more up on robberger.com. I'll have the withdrawal strategy or some of them. I'm trying to set up each section, even though they won't be complete, and get them all in place. And then I can start adding to them and everything. That's sort of the idea. So anyway, have a great week. I will have some more videos out this week. I don't know what about yet. If you have any topics you want me to cover, shoot me an email. I've only got about six or 7,000 topics on the list, but I'll take more. And uh, yeah, so have a great week. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy. Apart from checkmate, is financial freedom. You really can't buy checkmate. Anyway, that was stupid. I'm going to end the stream. Good night.